So I want to bring out two extraordinary folks, uh, first Stephanie and then Frida, who are using AI and machine learning to try to help us with hiring bias, and just as a vignette into one of the areas that we could do. So Stephanie, come on out. everyone. Um, so as you can see, I'm working on a product focused on mitigating unconscious bias. I'll show you a little bit of the screen so you can kind of see how the product actually works. Uh, so just hitting play here. Yep. Um, so as mentioned, we connect candidates algorithmically to jobs. We remove name, photo, age, any indication of identity. So you're only judging people based on how well they fit the role. And we're using AI and ML to strengthen the fit score by leveraging performance data. So we're not relying upon historical models of success to determine who's a good fit for a role, because we know that those models are skewed to benefit who's been historically successful. Um, and while you're making decisions anonymously, we also track the demographics of the people that are going through every stage of the funnel so you can identify where bias may be impacting key decision making from that initial phone screening to the final interview and beyond, even getting into compensation equity, performance reviews, and promotion rates. And lastly, a couple years ago, I released a product focused on companies where we actually analyzed the overall equity, diversity, and inclusion of over 200 tech companies based on things like the percentage of women and people of color they have on their board, uh, the demographics of their executive team, their overall US workforce diversity, and also the benefits, programs, and initiatives that they're Im implementing to focus on inclusion. We haven't really quantified inclusion, um, which is a major, major issue in terms of keeping women and people of color employed in a lot of big companies. And I was surprised to find the impact of this. We had a lot of companies come to us saying, oh, we don't like our score. This isn't fair. You can't compare us to companies that have much larger budgets. The reality is they're doing this. They're using algorithms to rate and rank candidates in ways that aren't normalized, that aren't fair, because they aren't annotating the data with demographic information. And so that's the strategy that we've used uh, for Blendor. So I'm just going to reinforce the importance of this book. Dr. Kathy O'Neill is one of our advisors, and she really talks about how fundamentally these algorithms are kept secret in a black box. Um, and for proprietary reasons, we don't know what's going into the decision making around how, who gets hired and who doesn't. So highly recommend it. Check out the TED Talk in the book. And that's it. Thank you. OK, cool. <laughs> Stephanie Nampton. All right, so I think you're going there. And then next up, uh, Frida Polly, you're coming on out. Great to be here, me and my 18-month-old uh, pregnancy that I got going on here. Um, so I spent uh, 10 years as a cognitive neuroscientist at Harvard and MIT, and then I went to business school and saw recruiting for two years firsthand, because uh, that's what MBA students do. And that's how I came up with the idea for Pymetrics. So Pymetrics uses behavioral neuroscience and AI to help companies hire in a more predictive and way more diversity-friendly way. Um, you guys all got a chance to go through Pymetrics, and I'm going to show you some really, really cool results. But our platform is very complementary to what Stephanie has built. We actually don't use resume data at all. We look at um, over 80 cognitive, social, and emotional measures to see how people fit to different roles. And the key behind the platform, there are really three key aspects to it. One is that the data we collect is largely unbiased. One of the challenges with data that's out in the public domain right now um, is that you know, if you look at you know, differences in data sets between men and women, they're obviously, oftentimes very strong. And it's hard to extract signal without getting rid of the bias. We specifically created cognitive, emotional, and social traits that we knew were not going to show gender and ethnic bias, and also socioeconomic bias as well. Um, so that's one piece of the equation that's super important. Um, then we train on a representative set of high performers within a company to understand what's really driving success. 
Uh, and you might think, wow, isn't that going to cause a problem? Because you know, that group may not be as diverse as we would like. And so back to the fact that we really try to make it as representative as possible, but also back to the fact that if the data that you're collecting from men and women is actually the same. Um, your algorithms can be quite predictive and also lacking in bias. And then the third thing that we do, back to Stephanie's point about um, transparent AI, is that we provide, um, it's an open box or a white box system, so you can understand what is driving the decisions that we're making. And then we audit all of our algorithms before releasing them to make sure that they're recommending women and men and people of different ethnic backgrounds at a similar rate. So we really think that the combination of representative sampling, um, open box or white box AI, and as well as pre-audited algorithms can really take Megan's message that AI can be a force for good or a force for bad. It's like electricity, it can kill you or can keep you alive. Um, and I really want to encourage everyone here to think of AI as a tool for increasing equality, increasing representation. Companies that we work with, Unilever, Accenture, we have over 100 enterprise clients at the moment using this technology live. Um, have seen dramatic increase not only in gender representation, not only in underrepresented minorities, but also underrepresented socioeconomic populations, which quite frankly is a huge area of diversity that we all need to improve. So thank you very much for listening. Um, and if you didn't get a chance to go through the platform before the conference, it's still open. We'd urge you to do that. And we've got some cool results coming out of it. So, yeah, so come, um, we, I guess you guys, yeah, thank you. Yep. So the main headline from us is let's take a hold of these tools and let's start applying them to areas where we have really serious problems. I mean, some people have decided that self-driving cars are the most important thing to work on. I think, you know, world child poverty, hiring, equality are also equally, if not more yeah. important. <laughs> so uh, we can do that. Um, but we have one of the great things is a lot of oppressive messages around us uh, that tell us we don't do math. Uh, Stephen, you have this fabulous origin story uh, that you got to share. Yeah, um, so uh, my mom was actually homeless for a little bit while pregnant with me. I was conceived in Tuskegee, Alabama. She moved in with her sister, who is a computer scientist at the University of Maryland College Park in 1984, when about a third of all CS degrees went to women. So I always tell people my first image of a computer scientist was not a white guy in hoodie and flip-flops. It was someone who looked like me. And so I went on and became a full stack developer, APCS, Stanford, MIT, applied for a job at Google and a little cool lead role, and they told me I wasn't technical enough that they would keep my resume on hand in case a more sales or marketing position opens up. And I found out at the time of 55,000 employees, they only had 12 African-American women in technical roles. And telling the media, it's a pipeline problem. We just, we can't find qualified women and people of color. And so I took my non-technical self and built the first version of the app. <laughs> awesome. You know, I, Having been at Google for years, most of the things that I worked on in diversity, I worked in the beginning of a lot of things I had to do in spite of the company until they finally started working. And then we could finally push them in. And often other people, <laughs> Laza, um, would, take, uh, <laughs> would take credit for it. Uh, so you know, that's the way it is. So there's so much bias. Um, and also, you touched on another thing, uh, just this, this idea that it's this pipeline back to kindergarten problem, not that there's plenty of people right here that come in, whether it's through Code Bootcamp, if they're not technical or they're already technical and there's bias working against. You also, similarly, you know, are coming from a science side and it was through encouragement to come this way. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. I mean, again, I think that, you know, as a scientist, um, luckily, neuroscience is a more diverse field, I would say, than entrepreneurship. So I actually didn't, you know, really experience a single digit problem until I became an entrepreneur and then started being like the only woman in the room. Um, and similar to Stephanie, I think, you know, when I started Pymetrix, I was a, you know, at the time, 30 plus year old single mom. Um, and everybody, you know, and I didn't have a CS degree. So everybody was like, oh, you know, not really sure. <laughs> it's really your thing. And, um, and it was just really interesting to see the reactions. You know, I remember getting, trying to get an introduction to an investor. Um, and, you know, this professor of mine, uh, who was just the sweetest man, but really just didn't see what we were doing as really transformative. He's like, in his, you know, southern drawl, was like, oh, Frida, he's like, they don't invest in companies like yours, you know? And it was just crazy to see, you know, the perception of somebody who wasn't, you know, a 24-year-old white guy in a hoodie and what kind of limitations you would be faced with just even out of the box, I think, so... 
this is a big part of noting like who gets to speak about what these technologies are for, who sets the agenda, who chooses who gets funding, who then gets puts that funding in and then gets on the cap table side, so then they make more money and it recycles again. And so there's this perpetual yep. motion machine of bias that's there. Yep. Now, you guys are uh, how many people right now? We're seven. Seven, OK, in an earlier stage. And you guys spend a lot of time, you were saying backstage, yep. at a much smaller size. For sure, yeah, we uh, spent about five years um, in between two and 10 people, essentially, you know, building out very early algorithms, collecting data, working with, you know, kind of early stage customers until about mid 2016, so about two and a half years ago when we launched our final product. Yeah, now we're about 100 worldwide. Fabulous. So just, you know, the stages of building these companies. Now, one thing I want to do is you guys did a, you, some people in here, some people took the Pymetrics, signed up for Pymetrics, yes, no, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah okay, there they are. Okay, so I think about 20% or so yeah, folks. And you right. found a very interesting result. Can yeah. you share that? Do we have the slide? We can just yeah, just up. bring up yeah. the. So we went through um, everyone's registration data to figure out. The blue slide, there you go. Yeah, what the current top two careers were. Now, again, we did this, you know, um, we had titles and companies, so the first was marketing advertising, not, not a surprise. Um, and the second was HR recruiting, also not a surprise, and that's great. For the 20% of you that ended up going through Pymetrics, and again, could not be a representative sample back to the fact that maybe they were like more you know, excited about uh, this tech platform. However, the top two careers, nothing close. Engineering was the top one and product was the second. Those would have been the recommended careers for the 20% of you that went through. So obviously very different than what was you know, coming in through the audience, which is really cool, right? So it's a question, I mean, it's cool, maybe it's slightly depressing in the sense that you, know, you had the experience, <laughs> like Stephanie, of like wanting to pursue a technical career, being told that you weren't technical. But I think this really shows the promise right, of what AI and unbiased data can do. Because if companies are now using algorithms that spit out results like this, as opposed to what we're seeing in the real world. I think that's really the promise of unbiased technology and hiring, so. Thank you, thanks for doing yeah. that. I think it's a really interesting result. Um, also, if you think uh, there's so many problems in the world, and how, why are we like not playing this part of the orchestra? Why are we not including these technologies? I got to talk to uh, Gorge Steinem a little bit earlier about um, the moment when the birth control pill was founded, was, was uh, being discovered, invented, and how Catherine Dexter McCormick uh, was a friend of Margaret Sanger. She happened to have a biology degree from MIT for 1904, and she was, uh, like Melinda Gates, the inheritor of a very large uh, fortune, the American Thresher fortune, so she's the money behind that. So her science and her funding is so, what would you guys say, we have just like a couple minutes, what would you say to folks about the challenges and what you would encourage folks to go use these technologies for whatever it is you are trying to invoke in the world. And maybe part of it is, I mean, you guys are scientists, technical folks, some people may or may not be. This idea of all of us and working together and finding techies. I especially tried in my examples to show you young people who are ready to do this work because you can pull them as your number two, three, four in this. Any thoughts? Um, the biggest challenge is the data problem, right? We need more women and people of color um, getting on LinkedIn, getting on some of the, the data sets that we're drawing from so that we can become better at assessing what signals are correlated to your yeah. success. Because right now, we're sort of left with historical data sets. And so we know what a, a really successful white guy could be, and we've built rubrics around that. But until we get more data around you and what makes you successful, um, we're very limited in our ability to sort of bake in what I call algorithmic empathy, yeah. where we're um, proactively creating rubrics, rubrics that um, can track why you'll be successful. And that's sort of where I've ded dedicated a lot of our time and resources. Yeah. And, and on that note, I would just say that looking at different types of data, like people's actual aptitude or potential and from a cognitive and emotional perspective can really help with that, right? Because that's where you're getting, you can train on sets that are not as representative and still get really great um, you know, representative algorithms. So I think that that's one thing. I think, you know, Megan, I think one of the things that you know, stops people oftentimes, there are many things that stop people. One is just discouraging messages too is just the fact that you can't don't have a similar access to funding there are a lot of different blocks um, along the way there's absolutely no doubt about that um, I do think that surrounding yourself with an inclusive community um, so Epimetrics you know we're over 50% women we're over 40% 
uh, non-white. And I think that surrounding yourself, whatever you build, surrounding yourself with an inclusive community can really buffer you from, I think, some of the forces that, you know, like writ large are kind of, you know, maybe not in your favor. But I think that if you can build your community to really, uh, you know, push you forward, I think that's one of the things that we've tried to do at Pemetrix. Yeah, and it's sort of ensemble teams uh, working yep. together. Yep. Yeah, so we are out of time. I guess one thing I would share was that uh, I got to, I was at the Heartland Summit um, in Arkansas, and we brought a fabulous entrepreneur who's running an incubator in uh, Oklahoma. And what they did, which is interesting in the same way of teaming up, they found that the tech entrepreneurs all wanted to work on particular topics that were very similar to stuff we've already seen, restaurant mm -hmm. delivery, whatever. So they went to the community uh, organizations in town and just had people spend time together. I know the New York Blend team is here. Getting people to spend time together to see the real problems yeah. in their communities and how AI, machine learning, data science, and these technologies, and the network of all of us uh, can apply to this is really urgent. The problems are harder, and so they don't need just a coder who can go on their own and make a car drive down the street by himself. Yeah. Um, they really need a lot of us on these really hard problems, and they're very cross-functional. So yeah. our message is please join us in the world of AI. Absolutely. So thank you so much, yeah, you guys. Thank you.